How do you believe in yourself, especially in a moment like right now where the future is right in front of you and it is swirling with endings and with beginnings? That's always how I feel in the summer, right? Summer is supposed to be this awesome time where we relax, we dial it down. If you're lucky and you can get to the beach, that's fantastic, or a pool. But when I'm at the beach, you know what I'm thinking about? My freaking future and the endings and the beginnings. And today, I want to throw how you believe in yourself in the middle of all these endings and beginnings. And how do you believe in yourself when you haven't even started taking the actions? How do you believe in yourself when you don't know how this thing is going to turn out that you really want to do? Well, my guest today, she's a super close friend of mine, and she is somebody you want to hear from right now. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about none other than Jamie Kern Lima. She's the founder of It Cosmetics, which... She started in her living room and she sold it to L'Oreal for a billion dollars. And here's the thing that I love about Jamie. Jamie is the queen of learning how to believe in yourself because when she started It Cosmetics, she was not some influencer with daddy's money. No, 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 no. She didn't get a degree in how to start a company. She was a waitress at Denny's with terrible skin rosacea, like the bright pink kind of breakouts all over her cheeks. And it was that rosacea that, and that hardworking work ethic from being a Denny's waitress that made her create her own foundation. And that was the beginning of this billion-dollar company that she created in her living room, It Cosmetics. And I know you're going to love hearing from her, which is why I am so excited that you're here to talk to us about your journey. You are one of my favorite human beings of all time. I cannot thank you enough, Jamie, for being here as my friend and for being here as the professor on the topic of purpose and learning how to believe in yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big, warm Mel Robbins podcast welcome to Jamie Kern Lima. Mel, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun and real and raw, and I can't wait. I hope it just adds so much value to everyone listening. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. There's no question because you know you have those friends in your life that you don't see very often. Mm. But every time you do, it's like no time has disappeared and you just have this like kind of twinkle on your skin because you just love being with this person. I love you so much, Jamie. I'm actually mad at you that you live so far away from me. <laughs> so maybe we should just start right there. I love you. Thank you. I feel the very same way. And one of the things I want to share, I know we're going to dive in deep on purpose. By the way, I love purpose professor. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Because it's one of our biggest life questions. How do I find my purpose? Um, but I just want to say, Mel, something really important to me that I didn't want to leave here without saying. You can edit this out if you don't like it, but everybody listening needs to know this. You are one of the rare human beings that is the same off air, behind the scenes, in your everyday life, as you are in all the public things. You know what I mean? And you and I have both met so many celebrities and so many people with millions and millions of followers, and it's very rare they're the same. And I just, one of the things I love so much about you is you are even more funny, even more intelligent <laughs> and brilliant and kind and raw and real um, in real life. So that congruency is like one in a billion, and I love you, and I'm just grateful to be here for you. Wow. Okay. <laughs> just that. <laughs> I think the episode's over now. Uh, <laughs> now, we got to go back in time because, you know, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because the entire mission of this show is to empower and inspire you listening to us right now to create a better life, whatever mm -hmm. that means for you to take the simple steps that sometimes feel impossible to pursue your dreams, to improve your health, to create greater connections, to believe in yourself. And Jamie truly is not only the professor of purpose, but her life story is a demonstration mm. in cultivating belief, belief in your ideas, belief in your intuition, belief in God, belief that things will turn out. And so I want to go back in time because, you know, I've heard you on the stages that you speak around the world talk about how you started as a waitress in Denny's mm -hmm. and then from waitressing at Denny's pursued a dream that you had of being on television. Mm -hmm. And as a fellow former waitress, 
I would love to start there. Mm. Yeah, waitress at Denny's, um, full uniform, name tag to prove it. Oh, I forgot <laughs> they had uniforms. Full uniform. Uh, what was your favorite thing on the menu? Oh, gosh, I love the pancakes. You know what? Just like simple. <laughs> um, it's so funny how our steps are ordered, I think, in life. Mm. And so often, I remember being a waitress at Denny's. I remember feeling, and, and maybe, um, maybe someone uh, listening to us can relate to this right now. You have this feeling inside of you like... There's something more I'm supposed to do, but you don't know what it is yet, and you doubt it might be possible. And I remember being waitress at Denny's and just feeling like I have these big dreams, but not quite knowing, like, how do I believe I'm worthy of them yet? And um, it was this big season in my life. Uh, At the same time, Mel, the kitchen at the Denny's I worked at was a disaster. Like, they would take an hour to get pancakes out. So I learned to talk to people so that they wouldn't leave. They often did leave. (laughs) Um, Or they'd throw, like, a dime and a penny on the table and leave. As your tip as if it's your fault. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh But it's so funny how, you know, years later when I ended up launching my own business, I'm like, oh, I've got to get the operations right (laughs) or nothing else matters. You know, it's just those little things we learn along the way. Um, But yeah, after, after that, I, I, um, I thought my whole life I would I would have a talk show. I watched Oprah in my living room growing up, so I thought for sure I would share other people's stories with the world. So I went into, uh, you know, did all the jobs, saved up all my money to to pay through uh, pay for school and and um, push grocery carts in the grocery parking lot, sliced meat in the deli, all those fun jobs, and then found myself in my in what I thought was my dream job, working in TV news. And I thought this is it, right? And what I didn't realize was I was about to enter this huge season of setback in my life, Mm. um, of self-doubt. I have a skin condition called rosacea. And for me, it started getting really red, really bumpy. uh, And I would be anchoring the news live thinking like, you know, okay, this is it. This is it. And I started hearing in my earpiece uh, from my producer, there's something on your face. There's something on your face. You need to wipe it off. You need to. And I was live on television, right? And I would glance down during the commercial break and I saw, oh, the makeup is breaking up on my face and these big red bumps are coming through. And it started this season that felt like setback. Um, but so often in life, the, the seasons that feel like setbacks are, are actually setups for what we're called to do. Okay, stop right there. <laughs> Did you hear that? The seasons of your life that are setbacks are often setups for what you're called to do. I want to just make sure everybody heard that. And I want to take a a highlighter and also highlight something that you said about being a waitress at Denny's. And it's this. You said our steps are ordered. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what that means, particularly to somebody who's listening, who may feel like, I know I'm meant for something greater. Yes. Why the hell am I at this step? And this does not feel like it is like on the path of where I'm supposed to go. Mm. So what do you mean by the fact that our steps are ordered? Yeah. I believe, you know, everything in life yep. is happening for us, even when it doesn't make sense. Ugh. Um, Can we just, what do you mean happening for us? So I to think, somebody that's like really in it, Jane. Yes, yes. What does that mean? Let me frame it around our topic of purpose, right? So often people feel empty because they feel like, oh, my purpose needs to be some job. It needs to be my job or it needs to be this, this grand thing I haven't figured out yet. But for those of us that have accomplished a goal we always dreamed of, we get to it and we're like, oh this isn't it, right? It's never, in my opinion, purpose is never this this big goal necessarily. Purpose is so often when we're able to serve the person we once were or serve in a way for something we've gone through. And here's what I mean. Uh, I think our purpose can be like, oh, wow, I went through a really freaking hard season Mm. in my life. And I now am actually realizing I'm born to be a generational cycle breaker in my family. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is an incredible purpose, right? Purpose can be like, oh, I've been having a hard season for a long time. And when I actually just take a minute and say hi to someone else who's lonely, maybe it's like in the the coffee line at Starbucks, maybe it's the, the, the neighbor down the street, whatever it is, you feel in your gut a sense of fulfillment, like a sense of alignment 
when you're doing something in your purpose. Mm. And I think that the big mistake people make is they think it's this end goal, right? A lot of times when people uh, hear my story and they're here, oh, Denny's Waitress builds billion dollar company, they think my purpose was to be some big entrepreneur. It wasn't? It wasn't. What was it? In the journey of how I did it, yeah, I took this massive risk, right? Taking my makeup off on national television when I was told not to, um, and and being brave enough to be seen mm. and helping other women realize uh, that they're worthy and enough exactly as they are, seeing them as who they are. To me, that is my purpose, and in doing that, um, it just a, a byproduct of that with it cosmetics is we built a company with millions and millions and millions and millions of customers. Uh, And what's wild is 5% of our customers actually have skin issues like I do. 95% don't. It's just that they felt seen and connected with something that spoke to their soul, right? For me, being willing to say, here I am exactly as I am, no makeup and, you know, all my skin issues, um, I think people connected with that, that feeling of, of, oh, I'm enough exactly as I am. You know what else I think is a really important part of your story? It is waitressing. Yeah. It's pushing carts in a supermarket. Yeah. It's working in the back house of a restaurant. That's my story too. Helping my best friend on her paper route, uh, bussing tables. And I think when you work in retail or you work in a service job. Yeah. And you feel at times invisible, Mm. you start to realize how important it is to treat everybody with respect and kindness, that there is no work that is beneath you. And when you can bring that level of service to the job that you have right now, even if you hate it, even if people treat you like garbage, even if the, 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 the back of the house is not getting those pancakes out on time and yes. people are angry. <laughs> if you can bring a sense of grace and service and just humility to those roles, I think it changes how you show up when things start working out because you don't ever forget what it's like to be treated like shit. Yes. Because somebody was mad that their pancakes weren't out on time. Yes. Yes. And also you and I have had this experience where we've truly gotten to see and be almost every type of person in every type of environment. And so now it's like, whether it's me building a business or you building one of the top shows in the world, (laughs) one of the top shows in the world, um, I feel part of that was like, oh, we understand who, who's listening and watching you right now. I understand who real people are who built, you know, who bought, who bought my products. And, and, and so when you mentioned steps are ordered, it's like, you know, no matter where you are in your life right now, what you're going through, I believe every piece of it, whether it's, oh, someone just, you know, cut me off in a parking lot and screamed at me or, oh, whatever it might be you're going through, all of those things are happening for you, Mm, I believe, so that you're amassing this toolbox of understanding uh, and getting strong enough and equipped enough for the purpose you step into. Amazing. So Professor of Purpose, Jamie Kern Lima, (laughs) right there. That's your takeaway number one. The steps are ordered believe in that. Mm. And this moment is helping you. It's giving you something. So that is one major tool that you used along the way. Let's go back to that moment because I think you were 28 years old, right? Mm -hmm. When you're sitting on television in Seattle, Yeah, you are a local news anchor, you're living the dream, you're on your way, and you are now starting to have this nightmare happen Yes, where your rosacea is breaking through on camera in front of everybody, yeah. the makeup that they put on you. Yes. And you've got people in your ear telling you, there's something wrong with your face. Yes. And you're realizing, holy cow, the makeup that they've put on my face cannot cover the rosacea and the skin issues that I have. So yeah. what do you do in that moment? Well, the first thing I did was start freaking out, right? And I <laughs> like, literally, I started entering the season of self-doubt where I would be live on the air uh, anchoring the news, thinking thoughts in my head like, oh, am I going to get fired? Are viewers changing the channel right now? Like, am I costing the the company ratings, right? So it was this Could big... you feel those moments when you could feel like the makeup not kind of like disappearing? Like there were moments when I used to be a commentator for CNN. I was pre-menopausal 
where I could feel the hot flash coming. Mm, yeah. I didn't feel it until they said it in my ear and in my oh. earpiece. And then what would start to happen was I would get so nervous and stressed mm. out because they kept trying to cover it um, during commercial breaks. I could feel my heartbeat in my ears. Oh. So I rem- <laughs> what I remember is like anchoring the news live and, and, you're, and sometimes you have to be happy, tell this happy story or, or you're serious telling. And I just remember my heart beating in my ears hoping people weren't turning the you know changing the channel and oh my God. and it started this this thing where i you know would spend what you know it's funny i was i was um anchoring the news and people think when you're doing that you must have all this money but you really don't get paid much at all and I, no. I took my little paycheck that I had and started spending it on um, department store makeup uh, professional artistry makeup drugstore makeup I couldn't find anything that worked and I had this idea one day like oh if I can't find anything that works for me uh, there's probably a whole lot of other people out there that feel like makeup doesn't work for them and it was sort of this idea where I was like if mm. I could figure out how to make something that worked for me um, it helped a whole lot of people. And that was my my knowing or this 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 gut feeling. But then my head, Mel, was like, oh, but you got no money. You got no connections. You know no one in the beauty industry. You're unqualified. So I sat in this place, right? And I just want to – we're talking about purpose. I had this gut feeling like I was supposed to go for this thing. But then my head – was like, oh, but here's all the reasons why you're not qualified to do it. Plus you're in your dream job, right? And I sat between those two. And it wasn't until I had this big, big aha moment of why I needed to do it that pushed me over the edge. Okay, so what is the aha moment? Yes. Yeah, so 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 I realized one day, I'm like, this makes no sense. There are thousands of makeup companies out there. How does nothing work for me, right? Then I had this moment where I realized I've never seen a model with bright red bumpy skin saying, you know, selling makeup. Like you always see these photoshopped, airbrushed yeah. models. And I realized, Mel, like, wow, my whole life, I've actually loved those beauty commercials. And I love seeing the magazines. And, and and I always aspired to look like them. But but deep down inside, they always made me feel like I wasn't enough. Mm. And I had this moment. I was literally on the news set when this happened where I was like, wait a minute. What if it's not just about launching a makeup product? Like, like what if I could actually figure out how to do it, which I had no idea how, and I had no money. But it's like, what if I could actually launch a product that works for me? And what if I actually put real people as models, like every age, shape, size, skin tone, skin challenge? What if I use them as models, call them beautiful, and mean it for every little kid out there who's about to start doubting themselves and, and, and every grown woman who still does. And that deep source of pain from, from, from how I was feeling not enough and what could I do about it, that, in my opinion, is one of the strongest ways to find your purpose. It's, it's what has just destroyed you or hurt you that you've maybe made it through. Yeah. And how can you now use that making it through to help someone who's going through it? Okay. <laughs> That's like a mic drop moment from our professor of purpose, Jamie Kern Lima. So again, I like to unpack these things to make yeah. sure this is a this is a I always say this is not just a listening podcast, it's a doing podcast. And I want to make sure nobody's left behind. Yes. And there was billions of dollars worth of wisdom that you just dropped. And so I want to try to unpack it for anybody that is listening to this and you have this sense that you're made for more. So one of the things that I heard is look in your life and see what problems or frustrations or things that you're struggling with that feel like a setback. And Jamie gave you the example of the rosacea on her skin and her inability to find something that actually could help her solve this issue of being able to cover it up so that she could do her dream job. And that setback is a setup for something new. And then get out of your own sort of selfish or self-loathing or the self-excuses and the self-pity and remind yourself that there are 8 billion people on this planet now. There are other people that are dealing with this. And that if you can figure out how to put your energy into making this better for yourself, and you bring other people into the fold with you, you now have something that's worth working on Mm. because it helps you and it's going to help other people. And I also want to point something out that Jamie will not tell you, but I sure as hell will. And that is that this was about 14 or 15 years ago. 
So we're talking 2007, 2008, correct? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, Jamie Kern Lima is the reason why we have this real beauty movement. There always has to be the first person, and she was it. So when you look around the, the internet and social media and you see people doing naked faces, that was not something people did in 2007. It was all airbrush. It was all perfection. That was the beauty standard. There were no plus size or curvy models. That was not a thing back then. And so you've got a woman who is sitting in Seattle, who has no experience and no money, deciding that she is going to not only figure out how to create a makeup line for people who have issues with their skin, but that she's going to do something nobody has ever done, which is put real normal people like you and me into her campaigns when she finally gets this figured out. And she's going to show people what her skin actually looks like in order to sell it. I mean, that was a revolutionary idea. She was the first, and I'm telling you this, because you could be the first. You have something inside of you that is a problem, something that you can solve, and you could be the first to change the way that people think about an issue. And so, Jamie, let's pick up the story, because how do you go from this aha moment, like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, to doing something. Yeah. Because I think some of us have aha moments, right? Yep. And then we But we don't him. do anything. <laughs> yes, because we doubt him. We yes. doubt him. We think like, oh, someone's already done it. Yes. Or oh, whatever. First of all, if you're out there right now and you think, oh, you have an idea or or a way you want to show up in the world or 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 someone else you, you know, uh, you want to help, but you think, oh, someone's already done it. Literally, there's only one of you in the entire universe, which by definition means no one has ever done it the way you're gonna do it. Mm. So when I launched this Say that again, Jamie, <laughs> for the people that are like, whoa, 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 kids. Calm down. Uh, I, wait, Jamie just said something. I was doing my dishes. Say that again. Talk about the fact that this matters. This is huge because I think the biggest reason we talk ourselves out of things is we think, oh, someone's already done it. Yes. Someone's already done it before, you know, who must be smarter than me or more talented or more whatever it is than me. And, and what I have learned and then proven. And I want to tell you too about all, I'm going to get so excited, Mel, because no, <laughs> when you do this thing, like don't be shocked then when there's millions and millions of rejections and people don't get it, right? Um, uh, uh, because it's never been done before, right? Oh, yes. Because there's only one of you. There's only one of you doing it the way you're going to do it. But but just to recap that, there is literally only one of you in the entire universe, right? And so if you are going to show up to this world authentic, that means Whatever you do, if it's authentic to you, it's actually by definition, it's never been done before, hmm. right? And so when you show up that way, don't be surprised if not everyone gets it right away. Or, you know, in my case, all the experts I put on pedestals all said no, that this idea of, of, of how I wanted to um, connect with women, they thought it wouldn't work and they thought I wouldn't therefore make them any money. Um, so, but can I ask you a question yeah. real quick? How did you go from the aha? Uh -huh. Yes to starting. So yes. what did that look like? Like, cause yeah. I think like if you're in this space where, you know, let's just use an example. You've never actually, you don't know the first, you, you, you have this thing about catering that you yeah. just can't get it out of your head. You want to do these events. You want to, you've never actually done this because you had never yes. done anything with makeup. You had yep. no idea what you were doing. Yep. You have an idea and you have an aha moment. Mm -hmm. What was the first thing that you did to start to make this real? So leaning on that, why I had to do it mm -hmm. and why I felt like it was going to be part of my purpose was mm -hmm. a big thing that helped me actually take the risk, quit my job. Wait, and you quit your job because you had an aha moment? Yeah, it was deep. I was like, if I had- What did it feel like? It felt like, um, it felt like if I didn't do it, I would wake up the rest of my life with this pain in my gut, this longing knowing I was created for more. Um, it felt like if I didn't do it, I would have the pain of regret. Mm. And if I did do it, I might have the pain of failure and maybe the pain of embarrassment and then maybe the pain of, oh, wow, that wasn't, that doesn't feel like it went how I thought it was. You know, I knew it was this big risk. I yeah. knew I was leaving what I thought was my dream job. Why did you um, have to quit your job? Just curious. 
it was literally from day one, I was all in. Like it was, I dove all in. I knew if I was going to do this, I needed to just go all in on it. Um, and you know, I, I started, I do not recommend this, but I started working like hundred hour weeks from the beginning. I was so freaking passionate about it. Like I couldn't stop thinking about what if I can actually figure this out. What if I can literally, because it, it, it became a big So did dream. you have any savings? Like, do you have a little bit Very of savings? Very little savings. Because you didn't pay yourself for the first three years that you did this. First three years. So basically, my husband and I wrote this business plan, right? Yep. Um, quit our jobs, dove all in in our living room. We poured all of our savings into it. I thought, Mel, and this is, this is for someone watching us right now. I know this. I thought if I can figure the product out, it's going to be huge. Right. And then I realized like, oh, being an entrepreneur or, or, or launching a dream is not always that easy. We poured every penny we had into it. And I, it, once we actually created a product by, and we were scrappy. If you want to know how. did you how, create a product? Like are you in your yeah. kitchen buying stuff at the grocery store or how does this even work? Okay. So no. So, so first, um, I love that, you know, technology is right there, right? So, so researching how are makeup formulations made? Who makes them? What are the FDA regulatory compliance? All the unsexy stuff I know nothing about just diving into the research phase of how does this happen. And then what I learned is that uh, manufacturers are, are, are makeup companies' closest held secrets, right? Like closest held secrets. They won't disclose who they work with, but hmm. a lot of these big manufacturers work with all the top brands that you see or a handful of them. Gotcha. So, so I started. So are you saying that all of the brands and top brands that you see are basically manufactured by a handful of companies? Yes, handful okay, of companies. It. And then some do it in-house as well. Gotcha. Um, so what I did was scrappy. I walked into a Sephora. I wrote down the name of every single brand in there, <laughs> went home. You know, I had no money, right? Cold call every single brand and saying like, oh, um, I'm looking for a really great manufacturer. Could you let me know who you manufacture? And then they hang up on me. You know what I mean? One after another, after another, after another. And I got this really small brand in a totally different kind of positioning where the girl who answered said, oh, here's who we use. They're in New York City, blah, blah, blah. So that was my first manufacturer. Reached out to them, had a meeting in person, uh, had no money, poured this idea out to them. They took a, a risk making me samples. Uh, and that's how it started, was just really being scrapped happy um, and, and trying to figure it out. All of our money had went into uh, the product development formula and the yep. advisory board of the product. Yep. And I thought, okay, now we have a product that works for me, right? This was after hundreds of formula iterations. I thought that was going to be it. So is this like year one or year two? Like how long did this take? Yeah, it took a, a good first year to okay. get that product. And then what I started doing was sending it to everyone I thought was just going to believe in me instantly. So I sent it to Sephora and, and, and Ulta Beauty and all the department stores and all of the online retailers, QVC, which is, you know, live television shopping channel. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be huge. Every single one of them said no after no, after no, after no. And to your point, it became three years of not being able to pay myself, three years of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of no's, of crying myself to sleep at night. Were you and your um, husband like fighting like crazy, like you should go back to work, you should, but why do we do that? Like, were you like doing you, that? You want to know what it was? Yeah. We still believed in it, but we weren't sure how we were going to make it. It was like friends and family that were like, uh, wait, you quit your job? Are you sure you should have quit your job? Or wait, you still haven't made any money? Like it's been three years, right? So you hear all of this the voices get so loud. Yeah. Um, the loudest, though, were my own self-doubt. You know, sometimes we take a chance and go for something because our gut is telling us to do it. And then all of a sudden, you face all this opposition and you start to question, is my gut wrong? Is my knowing wrong? And there were so many times where I would literally get this another brutal no from, you know, Sephora or QVC or whoever it was. And I would just literally cry myself to sleep. Um, I would pray about it and be like, God, I feel like I'm supposed to be doing this, but nothing is going right. So let's just pause in that moment. Can you just explain to everybody a little bit about the past four years at USC and the three pillars of this creative process that you just learned? Okay. So I was a popular music vocalist at the Thornton School of Music, but the process that I'm about to explain to you is, is the underpinnings of the Thornton School of Music program and the basis of our entire curriculum. So I will give credit to Chris Sampson, the founder of the program. Love you. And he's the one that 
shined some light on this process for me and gave it a name and gave it context in my project. So thank you. In order to tell you how, I used a process slash method that is the underpinnings of my entire program. It's what we do at Thornton for four years and then we learn how to do it ourselves before we graduate so we can create whatever we want. And the process is three steps, emulation, assimilation, and innovation. That's okay, hold on a it. second. So it's so three steps are... Emulation, yep. which means to imitate, to match or surpass some kind of achievement that you want. So that means pick something that you're inspired by. Pick somewhere you want to go. Pick somebody who has more money than you that you want. Pick somebody that has a house you want, anything, a North Star. Pick a North Star and break it down. What does that thing have that you don't? line it all out. So for me, I picked Sarah Bareilles and Brandy, who are two of my favorite artists, and I broke them down. They're both strong, powerful, fierce. They both can songwrite, they can sing, they can play instruments, they can arrange, they can produce. They're advocates, they are powerful in their career, they collaborate, those kinds of things. Once I broke them down, then it was time for me to assimilate, which is step two. And assimilate is the 10,000 hour rule. Step one, you find a North Star or it will find you. Yes. Now you're in emulation phase, and here are the three oh, pillars. Oh, you can't start emulation phase until you have a North Star? I don't think so. Wow. You got to have somewhere to go. Can you start the emulation process by simply saying, I just don't want to be where I am? Yes, but I think it gives you an anchor when you have somewhere to go, and I think that it could just be the opposite of where you are. <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm, if you're, if you're somebody who's, you know what I'm saying? Amy, what are you thinking? I think the emulation phase is so brilliant because picking the North Star is something I think a lot of people don't even realize they can do. You know, like they, they just feel like this is me. This is who I'm always going to be. I can't change who I am. I'm not really sure about learning new skills. I, I, don't, they don't even think about, you know, doing the research, looking at other people. And I just think that alone is brilliant. Mm -hmm. That alone gives you a life jacket. You know, that alone gives you that step up to closer to the person who you want to become. Just knowing like your number one, you can just look at them and, and figure out how they did it. Okay, brilliant. Like, duh. Yeah. Like, okay. Or, or I mean, it does, you when, say that you're, the person you want to be more like your North Star, whatever you want to call it, is Bill Gates. You might not want to be exactly like him in all walks of life, but there might be one thing he does that you want to emulate. Like it doesn't have to be their entire persona. For me, for my specific project, it was because I'm obsessed with and in love with <laughs> their artistry, which is what I want to emulate. But for you, it can be one tiny sliver of somebody's character. I have somebody like that. Do you have somebody like that, Amy? I have a tiny sliver example, but I want to hear yours. No, I want to hear yours first. Well, I... <laughs> you look like you don't want to say this it out is, loud. Now I'm like, why did I say this? <laughs> because I have to reveal my dirty secret, which is I used to watch the... Um, housewives series on bravo like all the time really yeah oh yeah that was yeah does um, our producer andrea know yes that? she knows we, she used to be andy we, cohen's yes, EP. yes okay she she and i have a lot of deep conversations about that but anyway <laughs> i um i were a very simple simple example i remember there was one woman on the show that was of course always controversial and fucking things up but also really super fun and kind and I noticed she would say like a couple of words that I would never say to people. And it's not what you think. She would call people love, like say, hey, love, how are you today? How are you doing? And I just thought that was just the kindest, most beautiful thing to say to somebody. Oh, thanks, love. I'm, I appreciate that, you know? And so that was like that sliver where she was, you know, this is a super tiny sliver, but she was my North Star. And I like got up the courage to start talking like her and start being really open and being kinder to people. And now that's a part of my vernacular. You know, I say that all the time, like, hey, love, how's it going? You do. And I, but that was not me in the beginning. That was not who I was. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad that I, that I did that without knowing the entire process. But yeah, that's what I, that's what I did. And I feel good about that. Do you have one for that like a you want to, yeah, that, no, that you want to commence now? A thing that I want to start doing now. Yeah. 
probably get to the point a little faster. <laughs> no. Um, a thing that if I want to If you were graduating oh, and you were going to commence. Yes. What is it? It would be from the school of rock hard bodies and incredible muscular abs. That's the school I would want to graduate from. Yeah, I want to I want to do like a little bit of a body makeover. Mm, you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Right? So, who would I emulate? Who's your who's your who's your dream body? North Star. Yeah. I'd have to check my Instagram and get their real names. <laughs> well, let's but, say it's yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay. Or Jennifer Aniston. Mm more of a more of realistic for me thanks yeah okay well i wasn't sure if we were going thanks maybe, love I, I wasn't sure if we were maybe going yeah maybe no, younger like same yeah. age little no older. it was risky waters that you okay. jumped you know into what? and you did it you so that was jennifer nice. aniston is my dream body okay so, so all right now we're on the same page now you know what i'm talking about her and just go with it the hawaii yeah. scene there you go you want to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I need to look that up now. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't ever recall it's, seeing her in a bathing suit. We'll stitch oh. that in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, let's yeah. say that she is your dream body as she yes. is mine. So you break her down. Yes. What she does, does she do? A lot of yoga. Okay, a, a lot, lot of, yoga. of yoga. And like every single thing she does, yeah. you don't have to do every single little thing, but learn a lot about what she does and yeah. start to assimilate it, which that's is step, step two. Yes. Step two. Okay. Start to weave it into your own makeup, into your own being, into your own everyday life. Yeah. Do yoga more, eat more greens, whatever she's doing. Right. Then at the end, innovate. You're going to have to put your own Amy twist on it because what I'm you need it. to do to get your dream body is not going to be exactly what she's going to do. And it won't look exactly like hers. No, but but, but it, being able to break her down and adding some of her qualities into your everyday will help you get to your own version of that dream body. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Let's hear a word from our sponsors real quick. And when we come back, Ken, I got another question for you because I'm really curious about this North Star moment. Once you determine that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles were your North Stars, I want you to see if you can break down the exact steps that you took next, because I think it'll help all of us apply this to our lives. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins. I am so thrilled that you're here with us. I'm sitting here with two people I love, our daughter, Kendall Robbins, who just graduated from University of Southern California, and one of my closest friends, Amy, who also works for 143 Studios. And we've been talking about identifying a North Star, which is a person that you really admire or want to emulate in your own life. And our daughter, Kendall, had just explained that she had identified that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles were her North Stars when she decided she wanted to be a singer-songwriter. So, Ken, once you had those two identified, what the heck do you do next? Like, what are the, what's the step-by-step -step process? Now it was time for me to learn how to be a producer, how to be an arranger, how to be an advocate, how to collaborate, all of those kinds of things that I didn't already have. And that will be the biggest chunk of your journey and will take a long time for me it took up to four years it's a lifelong journey so it will take for the rest of my life for the rest of the time that I'm on this earth and then once I was done assimilating those qualities that for example Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles have in their artistry and in their humanity it was time for me to create something of my own and so once I had all the skills that I had to become to be a producer and the skills to be an arranger and the skills to be an advocate and the skills to be a collaborator and a songwriter and a singer, et cetera. I then went and created my own music and inherently it will have my own twist on it and it will have my own flavors of Kendall Robbins on it that Brandy Norwood and Sarah Bareilles will never have. But that's just the beauty of creating something of your own is that it will always be a reflection of you because you're the art and I think this process of I'm going to line it out for you one more time <laughs> emulation number one assimilation number two innovation number three is a process you can all use to get wherever you want in life whether you're an interior designer or you're a banker or you're a mom or you're a sister or you are an artist like me you can use this process in your life to close the gap between where you're at currently and where you want to go. 
I think this is fascinating. And I can see how I can do this in my life, which is why I'm glad we're talking about this, especially with the example that you gave, Amy. But for the sake of everyone listening, can you make this even more granular, Ken? Especially that first part, because I know that's where we're all going to get tripped up. How do you get started once you have the North Star, that kind of person or that thing that you want to emulate, that phase where you start imitating? How do you get moving on that? Well, I can explain my program and how it's structured that way. Yeah, in the three pillars. Sense. Will you do that? So first and second year of USC in my in my program, it's popular music performance and there are popular music performance vocalists, popular music performance songwriters, bass players, drummers, guitar players, piano players, et cetera, instrumentalists and singers. And they, our professors p- put you into bands one drummer, three singers, one bass player, you get the deal. And they assign you different songs per week. Um, And the repertoire begins in the 50s all the way through early 2000s into present day pop songs that we cover in class. And so on the first week of class, you get songs from the 50s and the 60s, and they assign these songs to you and you learn them and you learn how to emulate them, how to imitate them, which is step one. Can I just stop right there? I thought this was really interesting because this was not like the popular music shows that you see where you're supposed to sing somebody's song, but do it in your own way sort of thing. This was very specific emulating step one meaning they had you singing these songs from the 50s that a lot of you're like are you freaking kidding me this song is so stupid and you were graded on if you're a drummer can you imitate that drum technique and pattern of that exact artist Mm -hmm. like they're making down to the 16th note down to the millisecond of the song how accurately can you imitate it how accurately can you replicate what what the original instrumentalist or artist or group of artists did together? How how ac- you're graded based on how accurately you can emulate it. So for me, it was the intonation, the phrasing, the riffs, the runs, the notes. So for the first two years of my program, that's all we did. Every single song we were assigned, that was the objective. It wasn't to sound like Kendall. It wasn't to be the best I could be and do all my runs and do all my riffs and belt as much as I could. It was to sound exactly like the artist. And the point of that is so you can start to understand the building blocks of popular music. But I mean, for any of you listeners, it could be to just understand where you want to go. You talked about closing that gap, Kendall. When you see the gap, it is so overwhelming because you feel so far away. Like, how did you feel when you were in high school as a graduate, or even right now, how far away as a high school graduate did you feel from somebody like a Sarah Bareilles or a Brandy Norwood? So far, the furthest. And I still feel very, very far from that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But is there a difference in how you view the gap? I'm already there. What do you mean? I Well... I feel like I already have all of the skills that I need to have to be a professional recording touring artist. I'm just getting closer and closer to her and building and building and building. But like, I think I already have the skills and the tools and the knowledge. It's just figuring out how to apply them and figuring out how to apply them in a way that gets me to where I want to go. I agree with you. I don't think that we should call it a gap. Gap implies that it's a loss and it's not yes the most beautiful thing in life is that space because you're gonna grow and you're gonna learn and you're gonna fail and you're gonna screw up and you're gonna meet people you love and meet people you hate and meet friends you don't want but thinking about it as a gap is you're never gonna get there if you think about it as a gap it's it's the road you get to travel it's about the journey not about like yeah don't think about it as the gap that's step one yes but step two is i want you to think about it as like gaining something it's like a lily pad effect every lily pad you light up is yours now to keep yes and so i and the second thing though that people feel when they look at that moment of commencement and they look out into the future and they see all the things i got to gain along the way and all this it doesn't feel like an opportunity and also people have no idea how to start and so one of the things that i found to be really interesting about your presentation 
is that you took Sarah Bareilles and Brandy Norwood, and they were your North Star, but then you divided them into three categories of character, skill, and what was the other one? Career. Career. And by dividing it into three categories, you now made it concrete. What are the skills that I need to gain? What is the character attributes I need to gain? What are the aspects of their career in terms of their experience that I need to gain? Well, let me just correct you. Not need, want. Great. That want I want to gain. Okay, so why is it important to say want versus need? Because need implies that if you don't have it, you're at a loss. You don't need it. You just want it. And that's beautiful. Well, I think want it's more motivating. Yeah, that too. That's right. Because I slipped into the language of gap and loss. Oh my God, I need that thing or else I'm not going to get there. If you talk about it in the abundant language of gaining something, all of those things are opportunities to gain something that, that help you walk closer mm -hmm. to the future you. And so I'm curious though, because not everybody wants to be a recording artist. Some people listening are like, I just want to date somebody or I really want to be healthy. Or for me, I see this applying very much, these three pillars and these three steps to how do I get my personal financial life in order? I've been living in this mode, I think, of scarcity and fear ever since your dad and I were nearly bankrupt well over 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I want to graduate from that. I want to commence a whole new way of operating. And there's a lot of skills and habits and support that I need to gain on the road ahead. And I just would love to hear you talk about, okay, you identified Brandy and Sarah, but what would you recommend or what was the next step in trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I break apart who this person is to help me start to think about what I, what I need to gain or what I want to gain? Got to catch myself there. For me, it didn't require very much research because I feel as though I have an intimate relationship with these two artists, although they don't know that I exist. Why do you feel but like you have an intimate I've relationship? I've been listening to their music for all of time and I've spent thousands of hours on YouTube watching their interviews and reading articles about them and reading their books and just consuming everything they put out into the world. And so I think for all of you people that maybe want to get into a relationship or start eating healthy or making more money or so on and so forth, you might not necessarily have as crystal clear of a North Star like I did because I think my career warrants a lot more North Stars. Mm. But for example, for you, you want to you want to graduate from your scarcity mindset in your finances. You might not necessarily have a Brandy or a Sarah, an actual human being that exists on this earth that you want to be exactly more like. So what instead you could do is think about that future version of you. What does the future version of Mel look like? Who is financially abundant and has an abundant relationship to it what are her characteristics what are her what does her career look like what are her skill sets like you can imagine yourself in a future in the future like imagine your future self who's eating healthy what does she feel like every day what does she how does she talk to her friends how does she move through the world how does she wake up in the morning break that down you can create it from nothing or you can look at women's health magazine and pick someone from in there and break them down and do the same thing i mean there are north stars everywhere but if you're feeling lost i think the first step is finding somebody something or someone and it can be the future version of you to inspire yourself you need to be inspired i agree and for me with the financial thing i didn't have a north star i just knew i was sick and tired of feeling either out of control or um, irresponsible or very reactive in that part of my life and that I wanted to graduate from that and commence something new. And the second that I made that decision, right, that I'm just gonna graduate from this, I gotta end this, I gotta start something new, 
North stars start to show up. But what I liked about your particular process is I think those three columns are genius. So I want to make sure you listening have these. Declare what you want to graduate from so that something new can commence. If you don't have a North Star, simply saying, I don't want to do it like this anymore. Like I'm done with college. I'm ready for the rest of my life, even though I don't know what the fuck the rest of my life looks like. For me, it was just like, I'm done feeling like this. I'm done operating like this. I got to figure this out. I want to be proud of myself in this area of my life. And I didn't know what that meant. And so just declaring it started to have all kinds of stuff show up. Like the first thing that happened is that is Ramit mm -hmm. came onto the podcast suddenly. The guy, I can make you rich. And that got my wheels turning. And the second thing that happened is I spent a weekend with a bunch of women that are friends of mine that have similar businesses who are way more successful than me. And as I sat around listening to them, I'm like, wait, you do what? Wait, depreciate what? Wait, what do you do? You, you, you have a, huh? And I started to feel that gap. And then because you had shown me this three step thing, I'm like, wait a minute, I got to flip this. I can gain these experiences. I can gain these skills. I can gain this character that I don't have right now. And so the three columns that I think could be applied in any situation are the skills or doing the sit-ups or doing the abs, but mm -hmm. there is something deeper in this step one process that your research allowed you to tap into. And you know, you asked me kind of what's an example of a North Star for me. It's probably a North Star for a lot of people. And that's the rock. I am so inspired by him. And there's a particular aspect about him that I love. And it's all in the character piece. It's in the fact that it's so clear that he's such a great guy. It is so clear that he is a person that's out there for the everyday person. It's so clear that he's so generous and humble and kind. And I also admire him in that he's such a, like, got such diverse businesses. It seems like anything he's interested in, he's like, whoop, pivot, energy drink. Whoop, pivot, we're doing shoes. Whoop, pivot, <laughs> we're uh, launching the uh, XL NFL League. Whoop, pivot, I'm going to do uh, this superhero movie. Whoop, pivot, I'm going to go do this thing. And I love that about him. You're fired up. Like, oh. I, I think this is a good example of like North stardom that you're- I want to commence you're that. So yeah, you, you got the fire in the belly about and, the rock. And so I've never though- been able to get past North Star. And I can think about the moment when I was like, there's my North Star. It was a singular Instagram post where he had a photo of him at this huge board table. And it was him and the person that runs Seven Bucks, their production company, the origin of which is that when he moved to LA, he only had seven bucks in his pocket. And he had this huge team of people and they were launching the tequila brand or they had already launched the tequila brand and they were about to launch the energy drink and they had their, uh, uh, you know, partnership with Under Armour. And it, I went, oh my gosh, wait a minute. He's not doing this alone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. He got really into, like, there's a team of people that he like builds these things with. Yeah. I need a team of people. Like I started to realize, oh wait, there are things I need to gain. Will I ever be him? Of course not. But for me, he's this North Star because it seems like he graduates all the time. He graduates from being a professional wrestler, right? And then he graduates from that role to something else. And then he graduates from that role to something else that he commences. He's always beginning something and gaining skills, but never, ever seems to lose contact with that character piece. And you can see it even in the seven bucks. Like the fact that he named his company after this idea of starting with almost nothing. And so I am really inspired by that. And I realize I got to get serious about doing step one of emulating. And that means doing this research and breaking this all down. I think one of the, one of the things I like is also that you talk about how you look at the rock and you're kind of like well how do I get there from here like how do I do that and that's and this process gives you like okay break it down I feel like there are a lot of different 
parts of this process where people stop. Number one, they would stop by not knowing that they could get yeah. a North Star. Number two, they could stop by being like, well, how do I get to be like The Rock? I mean, like, you know, like, the gap is, right? Huge. It's an opportunity to gain things. Definitely, I'm not picking him for to. my muscles. I don't need to. Yes. Goals. Okay, I don't want to so, pick him for that. But okay. so you could stop there and you could be like, you know what? I'm just never going to be like him. I'm never going to be like him. But then we have this breakdown. What's his character like? What are his skills like? What's his career like? Okay, I could put my hooks into that. Like yes. I could do that homework and and get these are things like, that I want. Like Kendall saying, "Yeah, these are things that I want." And 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 you're not going to be him. You're going to get closer. And how good is that going to feel? Mm -hmm. That's going to feel amazing. Like you must have felt great during this process. When or no? Well, <laughs> did you? No. Did yeah. You? I mean, to be completely frank, I. <laughs> did my entire senior project and talked all about all of these different attributes that I had gained over my time at USC and all of these different skill sets that I had been working on. And it wasn't until a week before my presentation that my mentor, Chris Sampson, shout out again, founder of the USC pop music program, gave me this process as context. He said, okay, yes, you've been doing all of the, all of these things. You've been adding all these characteristics and qualities and skill sets and techniques to your artistry and your persona, but there's no project here. You need to describe how you did it. How did you do this? Mm. How did you become this producer and this arranger and this kind and this funny and this humor and your perspective? And he gave me the context of this process. So I can promise you that this has been happening for your entire life. This is the way that we live in the world. This is literally the way that we move through the world. It's the way not only that artists create, but that humans create. It's the only way. You you see another, you're a finance dude. You see another company do something. Boom, the process happens. You just don't have context for it. It all start, the concept of being inspired by something and creativity is just an idea comes to you. An idea, a North Star, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing. I so, love that. So the mm -hmm. first the first step is emulate, which means to match or surpass a person or achievement, typically by imitation. That's the first step. And in order to do that, to match or surpass an achievement, you've got to break it down. You need to do the research. You need to understand it. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? You can do what I did, which will include my slide. I broke my two North Star artists into their skill sets, their characteristics, their character, and their career. Yours might look different, but those are maybe some guiding lights you can use and assimilate means to take in information ideas or culture and understand them fully so how do you do that so what is that how is that different than the process of studying this north star so you so you study your north star for example yours is the rock and you say oh i love that he has nine businesses mm-hmm you look at his nine businesses and you pull them apart and you see what they do. That's emulation. You have every little detail of the business. How many people work for them? What are they? What are they registered as? Um, how much money are they making a year? What's their target audience? All that kind of stuff. You haven't started doing that for yourself yet. You've just <laughs> identified I done shit. it. Yeah. No, I've sat and watched and been yeah. in awe. Yeah. Yes. But I ha and, and, and I now think it's I've time been for you yeah. to take in that information, that yep. idea, that culture, and understand it fully. Or you're and not going to graduate, Mel. And to, <laughs> and not only to, but to understand it fully means to digest it. Means yeah. to put to put it in an EpiPen and shove it in your leg. Understand it. Consume it. Practice it. Get in the library. Read the book. Figure out how to grow your audience to the exact same size that the this rock is has like his. Like the, if you're watching a movie and about this, this is the music montage moment yes. of yes. the change. Yes. Right? It's like that moment where yes. the girl gets the ice skates time and time again, grabbing the ice skates at six in the morning, going yes. to the rink. Yes. You know, yes. sweating yes. it out, taking yes. a shower, going to school. It's the 10,000 hour rule. Yes. To master it's something, you need, it montage. requires 10,000 hours of practicing it. And I did that over four years. I took classes. I took lessons with my professors. I studied in my room. I sang 100 million songs. It's this not, is my this favorite is, this part. This is the longest part of the journey. And it's the most beautiful part because so many other things come to you while it's happening, while you're trying to take all of these qualities and characteristics of your north stars and put them into yourself you're going to find new things out about yourself that are part of your journey that you'd never 
No. Yes. I love that. I love that you said it's the most beautiful part because I think that's the part I'm most in love with too. And I think there's a romantic aspect to it of you taking on a different way of being in your own life, you mm. know, and that you're purposely doing it to feed your own happiness, to um, explore a skill and deepen it. Like, I just think there's so much beauty to that. Okay, so I know I keep going granular, but I love this three-step process because I love a framework that helps you locate yourself inside of something that takes a long time. I haven't even started the emulation phase because I haven't done the research. I've I've admired, I've longed for, I've felt the gap. Well, that's step zero. Right. But I haven't done the research, like for real. How do you know, or do you know, when you get to that part when you stop looking at that North Star and realize that you've become it? No, because you'll never become it. Really? I'm never going to be Sarah and I'm never going to be Brandy and you're never going to be The Rock. No, but don't you become your own North Star when you start innovating. Yeah. I think that, well, what I'm going to say, which I think you need to include in the podcast, and which is why I'm going to debunk the statement you just said, is that this process never ends. It's not a close the gap. It's a circle. Hmm. It's not a, okay, circle's done, check, we're good, we're off. No. The second you get to innovate, I made, I wrote a, I wrote a song two weeks ago, I found a new artist I'm falling in love with. Process starts again. You create that business that The Rock starts, boom, you see a tequila company that you want that has nothing to do with The Rock. It starts again. Not to mention, within each step, this is kind of going to get confusing, but within each step, the process is happening within each step. Within emulation, it's going emulation, assimilation, innovation. You're innovating in the emulation step. You're emulating in the assimilate. Like it's all happen. It's it's a circle inside of a circle inside of a circle inside of a circle over and over and over and over and over. Which to me means that you've always been the North Star. You always will be the North mm. Star. And it's just a trusting in the fact that you're just expanding. It's not getting somewhere. It's just. Like, I, I, do you I know what I mean? I it's, totally don't know think what you mean. about it as like. I think about Brandy and Sarah Bareilles as a directional signal, not a destination. The process that I just went through, emulation, assimilation, innovation in my senior project. If Brandy and Sarah are over here, I'm expanding this way. But then I, boom, there's something over there that I want. Then I'm expanding this way. Boom, there's something over there that I want. I'm expanding it. There. Oh, there's something down here. I'm going this way. Oh, there's something that way. I'm going that way. Like, it's just a constant expansion of yourself. And I don't think that if it helps you to think about it in a one, two, three, so be it. But I think the beauty of this process is that it's not about the destination that you get to because you're never going to arrive where you want to be. Why do you think this is something that my professors always tell me, but People like Bill Gates, people like all of the Motown artists that created some of the greatest records in the world, they're still making music. Some of the greatest scientists in the world are still trying to figure out different hypotheses that they come up with every day. Why do you think they're still doing that? They haven't arrived yet. There's always more to create. There's always more to get to. There's always more that you're going to want to be. And if they thought they'd figured it out, they would have stopped. There would be no more music in the generations well, above you. it's not you. about figuring out. It's about the creative process itself. Yeah, exactly. And that's what this is. It's not about becoming the North Star. It's about... You are the North Star. Yes. It's about just figuring out what you want to figure out in the world. And it's about figuring out what 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 that even means. Well, yes, I'm I'm my own North Star. But who am I? That's what this is about. Not to get all... No, I love woo getting woo all and woo higher woo. power. I love but that. Who am I? That's what we're kind of here to figure out. Mm. And that's just what everyone else is trying to figure out. Well, right. and here's why I love tying the process of changing your life to the creative process. Because you start to feel lost and disconnected and stuck in life and purposeless when you stop creating. Mm -hmm. And when you stop growing. And it's through the creative process of having something that you are drawn toward that you can help yourself grow and you can keep yourself creating new things. And I would say that the reason why the Motown artists continue to create music and the reason why 
researchers continue to research. And the reason why people that have won Pulitzer Prizes continue to do what they do is because it's not about the song or the prize. It's about the process itself that brings so much into your life. It's about the expansion. Yes. Yes. And I've noticed that about you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm about to get really... <laughs> don't get emotional. <laughs> well, I'm about to get emotional because you used to be, and some days still are, but you used to be <laughs> the most tightly wound, gripped, it's got to be right. I'm scared. Like, it's got to be right. It's got to be right. It's got resisting this process. And you know how you can see and somebody that you're very close to what their gifts are. Like I can see that Amy can just open up the portal mm -hmm. and tap into this higher power in just an extraordinary, magical, magical, magical way. Mm -hmm. And I could say that about, I could say that about Jesse, who is one of the kindest, most thoughtful, like the biggest heart I've ever seen in a human being. For you, I've known since you were born that you're an artist. And it's painful to watch somebody resist their own expansion. And what I witnessed that day watching you deliver this senior project is I watched you, like, really own it. And I personally believe that it was the framework that he revealed that's been the framework for your last four years, the underpinnings of the program itself and the process that you went through. And it's no surprise to me that days before you're giving this presentation, he's like, well, what you're describing is these three pillars that the whole thing is. And then you could put it all together that that framework in so many ways liberates you from gripping because you can always locate yourself in it. And I also think thank you for saying all that and I appreciate you seeing my progress and seeing me but I also think I can speak from my own personal experience but the expansion that I've experienced over the past four years I thought and wanted to look a very different way for example when I got to USC I was just a singer and when I left I expected to have an EP and 25 original songs and maybe to even have played a bunch of shows and to maybe be going on tour who knows dreaming big that's what I wanted my expansion to be but through this process and through surrendering to this process and trusting in this process I've experienced expansion in ways I never knew that I would and in ways that I'm so grateful for and would not trade 25 songs for in a heartbeat and I think Yes, this process works. Yes, you can use this process, but you've got to trust that even if the rock is your North Star, if it pulls you in a completely different direction, you've just got to trust that if you stay in the process and you stay present and you stay grateful and you stay conscious of it, it's going to lead you to where you need to go because I've learned so much about myself and about my artistry and about my humanity through this process that I never even knew was possible and I still don't have 25 songs and I'm still not going on tour and I still haven't played that many shows <laughs> and I'm sure those are coming for me but I would not trade those for the knowledge that I have about me and where I'm at and where I'm going for the freaking world. What's the most surprising thing you learned about yourself through this three-part process? My hydrating eye patches are dry which means it's time for them to come off. Um... I would say that my biggest takeaway after being at USC for four years and from doing my senior project is understanding that my gift is not just my vocal cords and it's not just my ability to sing. And yes, that is God given, that is universe given, and that is something that I'm so grateful for and have no idea why someone gave it to me. <laughs> I'm so excited to use it and see where it takes me. But I've realized that my gift and my artistry is so much more complex and so much more dynamic than just these two little things in here. And that's true for every single person on this earth. I mean, 
my professors say this too, but you work on your artistry your whole life. You work on your career your whole life. You work on your family your whole life. But the art isn't that. The art is you. We are all works of art and living this life and figuring out how to live and figuring out how to be more like your North Star, just like how to be you or going through this process is just chiseling away at the sculpture that is just you. And I think USC has really helped me to actually see myself as that work of art and to see that I'm just hopping on this ride of emulation, assimilation and innovation and I'm going to ride this shit till I'm in the ground, babe. <laughs> and I'm see where it freaking takes Well, I'm going to hook my caboose to that train because the moment that you said, we are all works of art and living this life and figuring out how to live and figuring out how to be more like your North Star, it's just like chiseling away at the sculpture that is you. That is so beautiful, Ken. You are the artwork. You get, you yes. can create it. You can paint your own life. Yes, I think one last thing I want to say to the men out there, any man who feels a sense of failure or that they haven't lived up to their own expectations or those outside of them, any man who's been battling with or has battled with addiction or depression or any of these things that drag us down, mm. I strongly encourage you to start with you and to begin with forgiveness. Not always so easy, but without a doubt, I know from my experience, not just me personally, but being in the company of lots of men, that we are all working our ass off to do the right thing. And while we don't always believe that the results live up, it's in the forgiveness and the starting with yourself and the self-acknowledgement. And I want to go back to what you said in the very beginning. Because I know that we're going to get a ton of questions, Chris. Wow. How do I begin that? One step that you could take today is trying this habit of even just looking yourself in the mirror. Uh, I... I'm shocked that I'm even saying this, <laughs> given my initial reaction to the high five habit. But I agree. Start right there. Start in the mirror. Because if you change the story you're telling yourself about the person you see in the mirror, if you change the actions that you take in how you treat the human being in the mirror, if you change what you're thinking when you look in the eyes of the person in the mirror, that is the beginning of forgiving yourself. Like you will never forgive yourself if you, if you refuse to look yourself in the eyes with compassion and with forgiveness and with understanding. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm going to keep hammering this, everybody, raise your hand and high five the mirror. Because if you're at a place where you are beating the shit out of yourself and you can't stand yourself for whatever reason, whatever you did, we've all done something, you don't have to change your thoughts. The neurobics and the science of simply making the physical gesture of the high five, Chris, and all of the lifetime of positive programming associated with it, it has a chemical, a neurological, a psychological benefit immediately that is grounded in science. And so the physical act does the work for you and it starts to plow new neural pathways and it releases dopamine, all of which will help you do the other work that you need to do to walk 
down the road of forgiving yourself. But if you, you got to start by simply looking at yourself in the eyes and seeing somebody who is worthy of forgiving because you are. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. You could, you could forgive yourself all day long walking down the sidewalk, but it, it, that's, a, that's a futile exercise. The mirror is where it happens and seeing yourself. Hmm. It's one of the reasons why I always sign off the show by telling the person listening that I love you. I and love that about how you sign off. And I know you mean it. I do mean it because um, I just know how many people can't look at themselves in the mirror. Like, it's just so sad. And I know how much self-judgment we all live with because I've lived with it. I was, I even learned that it's been 15 years today that you really struggled with loving yourself. And it breaks my heart. And it, it, it feels good to have somebody tell you that they love you and that you're proud of them. And uh, to some extent, unless you're willing to do the work on yourself, to let love in from yourself, to demonstrate encouragement, support, and love by looking at your eyes in the mirror or high-fiving yourself in the mirror. If you can't do that for yourself, you will never let the love in that is all around you from other people because you don't believe you're worthy of it and you're proving it based on your actions. What are you thinking about? Because I can see you getting moved. Well, I'm... I'm always moved by the way that you sign off and tell people I, I love you. And it, it ties back to what I was saying earlier is just my own experience in being in the company of men who don't, you know, they don't feel that. Hmm. Uh, and I guess since a lot of what I've been talking about is directed towards the guys, I would leave you with one last thought. And that is that while you're standing in front of that mirror and you're looking at yourself, you may feel alone, but you are not alone in either the struggle you have with forgiving yourself or the judgments or the failures or whatever that may be, you are not alone. At a really wild level there's actually a human being in the mirror who needs you it's the one person you spend your whole life with and the moment that you can look them in the eyes and see a human being worth cheering for you'll realize you aren't alone because you've got yourself you know i want to thank you chris and thank you for speaking directly to men because you know everything that you're saying is universal and i do think it's important though for men and boys and people who identify as male, that you hear a male voice saying these things. It is critical that other men realize that your emotional health, your sense of self-esteem, self-awareness, self-love, and going back to the very beginning of what I said at the beginning of uh, this episode today, is that I think we get self-love wrong, Chris, because we think love is a feeling. But the truth is, you only feel loved because of other people's actions. And when it comes to learning to love yourself, you have to start with the actions. Actions that demonstrate love. And when you are able to stand in front of a mirror and look yourself in the eyes, that's an act of love. When you're able to bring compassion and understanding to the person in the mirror and you see somebody that's trying and you see somebody that has regrets and you see somebody who still has an incredible life to live and is worthy of love, that's an act of love. When you raise your hand and high five yourself and the human being in the mirror, that's an act of love. And so I love what you said because so many of us know and wish that we felt better about ourselves. We wish we would stop beating the shit out of ourselves. We wish that we weren't in our own way. And all the research also shows that the most important habit that has the biggest impact on our lives is being kind to yourself. It's in the 
actions, everybody. And so I just love that you shared all that. Change isn't easy. I wish it were. I wish it were easy. It is easy to identify friction. It is easy to identify your excuses. It is easy to identify the actions that you need to take. But taking those actions and feeling the emotions that come up and dealing with people's reactions, that's not easy. And it's really important for you to accept that and for me to accept that. Because when you accept the fact that change isn't easy, but it's possible, and it's worth it, and you're capable of it, that's the truth. And when you go into addressing all the areas of your life that aren't working, whatever that may be for this moment in your life right now, when you start this process and you remember these three things that your life is always trying to teach you something and the biggest teacher is areas of your life that create friction, full stop, period. The second lesson, that your excuses are bullshit. Every single excuse you have is tied to some fear that you have. That's it. And that every single excuse can be faced and addressed with a small action. Again and again and again. Now, the third lesson is really important because it's the truth. Change isn't easy. I mean, this year I uh, reorganized the team. I addressed the betrayal. I um, got seriously into therapy to improve a lot of friction in my marriage, both on my side and Chris's side. Not easy. It's not easy to sit in a therapy session and have to listen and hear stuff you don't want to hear. And it's not easy to change your own behavior when you've been doing things the right, for a long time. It's not easy to go to the gym for the first time. Heck, you know, I went to a hot yoga class when I was visiting my daughter in Los Angeles last week. I realized it's the first time I have been in an exercise studio for three years. It wasn't easy to get there. Now, I was happy I went when it was over, but I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that this is easy. When you know going into it that it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it, damn it, and that I am capable, I am capable of showing up for myself, I am capable of doing this, I am capable of inching along, I am capable of pushing through the fear. I am capable of identifying friction. I am capable of slowly moving my life from the shitty side to the awesome side. When you go into it knowing that, like that's what I did with this house. When we sold our house in Boston, that was not easy. I knew I needed to do it. I knew I needed to remove that variable from my life. That was not easy. And not only was it not easy, but I had a pretty big mental breakdown over it. I did not, I did not expect the wave of grief that was going to hit me selling the home that we raised our kids in for 26 years. I did not expect how discombobulated I would feel moving from a place that I had lived for 26 years and the container that held all those memories in that much time. It knocked me on my rear end. It was not easy at all. But now that I am on the other side of it, thanks to therapy and going back on an antidepressant for the first time in 20 years, I'll tell you, it was worth it. And I was capable of putting my life into the column of being in alignment. I am proud of myself. I am proud of myself for doing the work to finally launch this podcast. I am proud of myself, not because it's doing so well. I mean, of course, that's freaking amazing because your support makes me feel good. And I just can't believe 
what a force for good you and I are, that these episodes are truly changing and even saving people's lives. I mean, that's just extraordinary. But I'm proud of myself because I got over my own bullshit to do this. Do you know how liberating that is? When you push through your own stuff, when you commit to your happiness and to your goals, knowing this is not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Knowing that I got what it takes within me to remove friction, to go toward the things that I want. It is like one of the most amazing things in the world. And yeah, you may be like my son Oakley, sitting upstairs alone in a closet with nobody watching as you put your first video out there. Who cares? You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you and the potential of your life and the dreams that you have inside of you and the happiness that you deserve. Like, I I really feel like there's kind of two states in life because it's about energy. You're either feeling friction, and that means something's off, and there's just something to address. Don't beat yourself up. Big lesson for me. Just learn the lesson, everybody, because your life is trying to teach you something with that friction. Make your list. Any area where there's life, where there's friction, there's a pattern to address. There's a place that's making you miserable. There's somebody, a person. That's it. That's it. That's all that there is. There's a, that, that, there's a process. There is a process. Every breakdown that Chris and I have basically has to do with the fact that we have a broken process. When we are not in communication, Chris retreats and I keep going. And then Chris feels rejected. He feels taken advantage of. I have no idea because I'm blazing ahead 55 miles an hour. And what is broken is the communication process. Doesn't mean we're bad people. Doesn't mean the marriage sucks. It means there's friction between us because there's a broken process. And so again, this is such a huge invitation. Please, please do not run yourself into a wall the way I did. Do not ignore the lessons in your life that your life is trying to teach you via friction because they are going to get louder. That sledgehammer is a coming. And do not be a stubborn student like Mel Robbins. Do not wait for life to punch you in the face or knock you on your fanny or cause you to have a mental health breakdown requiring prescription medication, which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with. Sometimes we need those ladders. Sometimes we need it every day, people. I freaking love, love my Celexa right now. Thank you, Celexa. You have helped me through this shitty year. I am proud, proud to ask for help, whether it's for people or it's medication or it's new habits or it's from you. Because sometimes it's not easy, but it's worth it. And you're capable of doing whatever it takes. And it might take you years. It took me decades to finally learn the lesson about people that have toxic patterns and betrayal and my role in it too. Decades. It took me 10 years to realize that all of my success was born in a moment of crisis. You know, I didn't, I didn't go, I think I'll write a book today. I'm like, I got bills to pay in a lien on my house. And my husband basically has just left his business uh, and he's sobering up and he's depressed. And if we're going to pay bills, I got to figure this shit out. And I have never gotten out of that mode. Like when you can't pay for groceries, when you got liens on your house, you will say yes to anything that you need to say yes to, to stay afloat. And I don't think I ever got out of the mode of relating to work as though I was in an emergency. I always assumed my luck would run out, which is why I've been running like my life depends upon it. And that's why I ultimately hit a brick wall. It wasn't working anymore. It was making me miserable. And so when you stop and you write out the friction and you look at the lessons, please, like do it now. Do not do the same stuff over and over and over for decades like I have. You do not need to wait for a sledgehammer. 
You can wake yourself up with a blank sheet of paper and two columns and a pen. And you will wake yourself up faster if you have a friend with you who will be a truth teller. And you also need to honor the things that are working about your life. Because guess what? There are a lot of things that are working. And we need to do more of that. And when you are willing to learn the lessons that your life is teaching you at this moment. And there's always lessons. I'm sorry. It's whack-a-mole, people. That's what life is. You're going to fit. Here's the bad news. I got a lot of shit on the left-hand column now, too. It just is different stuff from last year. Because life is whack-a-mole. Life is, uh, life is school, people. You can enjoy it. You can hate it. But you got to attend it. That's, that's the deal. And there's a lesson every day. And the biggest lessons are in the biggest moments of friction and the highest moments of joy. And if you get serious about paying attention to the lessons and you get serious about your own baloney excuses and you get serious about just taking actions and inching forward every day and you embrace this notion, change isn't easy, but it's worth it and I'm capable of it. You, my friend will feel the happiness you deserve. You will remove the just stupid crap that you're tolerating. You will level up. You will make more money. You will enjoy it. Imagine that. Imagine enjoying it. And I realize you may be taking care of aging parents or you've got super little kids or you just went through a divorce or you got a big health crisis or you're in the middle of pitching a venture capital firm for the biggest deal of your life. The stakes are high. I get that stuff's going on, but I also know because I have done this in my own life this year that you can see what the lesson is. You can stop beating yourself up. You can fix the pattern. You can fix the personal dynamics. You can fix the places that you're showing up. You can fix the process. You do that. You get to work and my God, you're going to be shocked, shocked at how proud you're going to be of yourself. And I want you to know that I'm here every single day because I know you can do it. If you don't believe it, let me be the person holding up the the light over here going, hey, come on, walk towards me. I'll hold this light high till you catch up with me. And then guess what? I'm going to get hit with a sledgehammer and I'm going to expect you to go forward and hold that damn light high and remind me that I'm going to be okay. Because the second that you start to move things of friction from one column to the other, other friction will show up. One of your kids will have a breakdown. It it just always like a charm, right? People always say, how are your kids doing? I'm like, well, today, today everybody's okay. Because God knows tomorrow somebody could have a mental breakdown. It's whack-a-mole. But we're playing it together, right? We're going to ride the waves together, everybody. Selfishly. I really want to talk to you about transitions. And we are in a moment of time when this episode is going to come out where there's tons of people graduating and that's a major transition. And I am personally bracing, Dr. Marquez, I'm I'm bracing. Our daughter is graduating from college. I can feel the panic attack happening. Graduation is in 10 days. Wow. Wow. She is then going to leave California and come home for the summer. Wow. And she is an artist, a singer songwriter. So there's no defined career path. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know that the bottom is going to drop out. Why are transitions so damn hard? Hmm. Well, I can I can feel the pain already for you, Mel. <laughs> like I can just I can just feel like your whole voice changed. And there's so many people in this symbol. In fact, the world is in transition since COVID. It's a major transition. This is how I think of a transition. Before we even talk about why it happens or you know why it's so hard, is the way I see transition is somebody wants to go on a journey. Okay, and there's this idea of this dream life, this thing that you want to do. Um, and some are voluntary, some are not. Like your daughter is finishing, it's voluntary transition after college, and she has this whole life ahead of her. And so that's exciting. 
But then there is the old, right? And the old mm. I see as the shore. And so in transitions, we're like holding on to the shore of what we know, the certainty of the things that we mm. know sort of worked. It's no longer working, by the way, because you want this dream life. And then the boat starts to leave and you're holding on to shore and you're holding on to the boat and you start to get stretched thin. And that's what we start to feel. It's that panic that you're talking about. Yeah. It's that anxiety. It's that uncertainty that happens. But we are so afraid of discomfort. We avoid discomfort so much that we just continue to hold on. And this is the first thing I want to say to everybody. Let go and start swimming. Let go and start swimming. Because there is no ticket to a perfect life, right? That holding on is avoidance. And how many people have we heard that stay in a job they dislike, right? It's like holding on to certainty. I mean, I'm in the major of a transition in my life, in a career, and I'm as scared as you are, but like, if I just hold on to Harvard because that's what makes me good enough, then I'm never going to get to explore the world. Wait a minute. What's the transition here in the middle of? Well, so, you know, for the past year and a half, I really hit a wall at Harvard and Mass General. And I love what I did in terms of research, but I... I felt like there's so much more that I could do to help so many more people. I wanted to have an impact in the global world in terms of mental health. I wanted to bring that down. And let's be honest, an academic paper is not going to do it, right? It's just not. But I've been terrified to let go of this position and this academic self to jump into this like public speaking, writing books and I don't have a path for that. And so like when people ask me what I do now, it's like, well, I do a bunch of things. And, and you know, eventually I'll talk about like the integration of it, but like it is scary in transition. It really is. The first thing we all have to talk about is there's fear there. For sure. There's fear there. Well, I'm of course on the other side of the table from you and I'm really excited because I see a huge opportunity for you to make a massive impact by spending more of your time in the public realm, sharing your work and helping and impacting millions of people's lives by writing books and doing whatever else you may do. But I want to go and talk about the fact that when you write about transitions, mm -hmm. especially here in your new book, you talk about values, like what is the intersection of the transitions that we all have to go through in life, whether you're going to move or you're breaking up or you're changing jobs or you're thinking about your dreams or college is ending. Mm -hmm. What is the intersection of values and transition transitions? So values are so important. And yet most of the time when we talk about them, I feel like values are like a painting in somebody's house. You sort of know they are there, but you don't pay attention to them. Mm. So let's define values first, right? Okay. Values are intrinsic motivators. They are the things that matter the most to us, the things that should be our compass in life, mm. family, religion, um, wealth, um, integrity. Right, And so what is the intersection between values and transitions? Well, in transitions, our values are questioned. What matters the most to us? Let me give you a personal example to make this come to life for everybody. Yeah. Early on in my career, ambition was the value that mattered the most to me. Okay? And once you have a value, then we set goals with those values. For me, it was getting to graduate school. Then I had to go get into Harvard. Then I was an instructor, so I wanted to be an assistant professor. Right. Ambition was the value, and then I set clear goals to those values. Eventually, I got to associate professor. The day I became associate professor, a colleague of mine said to me, so what are you going to do next to become full professor? And that question bothered me. I was like, but do I want to be a full professor? Hmm. I had driven ambition because, see, ambition got me out of poverty. Ambition got me out of Brazil. Ambition is how I define how I would never go back to be poor again. But no longer ambition is working for me now. I'd lay in bed at night. And I had all the success in Harvard, and yet my brain was just not happy. I couldn't sleep. I put on 40 pounds, 40 pounds, right? And I kept saying to myself, what if I just write another grant? What if I just write another paper? You know, I, I don't have the right to feel the way I do with all the privilege mm. I have. And, and so ambition no longer was serving me, but I kept going at it, kept going at it. And one day, I was sitting in my office writing a grant, and um, half of my face went numb just numb. And the first thought I had is, Lana, this is anxiety. You're unhappy at work. You're writing a grant. This is just anxiety. Next thing you know, half of my body starts to tingling. 
and I'm terrified. And then the next thing I thought is, oh my God, I'm having a stroke. Yeah. I'm having a stroke. So I call the nurse. And, and meanwhile, I'm like, I'm an anxiety researcher. I treat anxiety. This is just anxiety. I want to say myself, but like half of my body is numb. And I just end up by the, the doctor. My husband like drives me. I'm crying. And at that point, I remember going to my primary care mag, Mel, and saying to myself, oh my God, I hit rock bottom. Like, this is no longer working. I know what I'm doing is no longer working, but now I'm about to lose everything, right? I avoided for so long and now I'm having a stroke. And what if I can't speak again? What if I, like everything in my life that I had worked so hard was right in front of me. And and I just had this moment of like, holy shit. Like, holy shit. I've avoided for so long by following this value that no longer served me. Yeah. And just to avoid my transition. Well, that's all I was doing. I was avoiding this transition. And so it turned out that I wasn't having a stroke, thank God. And they think it was a severe migraine. I've never had a migraine in my life. I don't I don't know. The neurologist, like, it was 48 hours of hell of, like, trying to just look. And, and that's when I faced reality. Like, that moment was when I paused and was like, I cannot avoid this transition anymore. I'm no longer actually living a value-driven life. I'm living an emotion-driven life. I'm just trying to not feel uncomfortable. So I keep doing the things. Mm. And you asked me an important question in the beginning, why this transition is so hard, right? Why does it hurt so much? Is because it creates so much discomfort. And in that moment, I was just avoiding it. I was just avoiding it. And I couldn't avoid it anymore. And, and I just hope, and the reason I share this with people is, I hope people wake up before they hit that wall because... We hold on to the old so much to, to not go towards our dreams. And I nearly killed myself in the process. And look at this. And, and think about how much skills I have. And I still avoided it. How do you figure out what your values are? So one of the exercises I use with my patients that I use that day is to actually do the opposite of what anybody does, which is to lean towards the pain. In the days after that nearly stroke, I sat with myself crying early in the morning for many mornings, saying, why does this hurt so much? Mm. What about this hurts so much? What is it that is missing? Like, what is in my life missing? And what I realized is pain only exists because behind that pain, there is a value that's extremely important that's being violated. It's not that I didn't care about ambition anymore. It's that what I really cared about is I wanted to make a bigger impact on the world. Mm. And I knew that the things I was doing were not aligned with impact. They make impact on the patients that I work, for sure. But I saw the world hurting. I saw the rise in anxiety from the CDC of 40% of Americans with clinical level of anxiety and depression. And here I was sitting in my little house with all the skills that my grandmother gave me, that science gave me, and I wasn't doing anything with it. I wanted to create a podcast. I didn't have a podcast. I wanted to write a book. I hadn't written a book. I wanted to go out there and meet people like you, and I wasn't doing it. And when I leaned into that pain, I saw impact, and I was like, wait a minute. I need to change my entire life. I need to change what I do. And so that's my recommendation. Lean towards the pain and ask yourself, why does this hurt? Because somebody is an asshole to you, okay? Right. They say something mean to you. You just say they're an asshole. But if somebody that you love very much says something like, you hurt me tremendously, now it hurts you. Yeah. It hurts you because you probably care about that person, because you probably love that person. It's not just that said something mean. is that it violated a core value. Wow. So are there, I'm trying to think about the example between kind of the transition that you're describing, which is one that I recently went through, like probably over the last two years of, again, achieved incredible success, but at a cost. And I knew that there was something that I valued more than chasing more success. Mm-hmm. And it was about connection and impact and peace and family and simplicity and artistry. Like it was about, a, and you can have more than mm -hmm. one value, right? A hundred percent. You can have more than one value. But, but slow it down for us, Mel, if you don't mind. Because like, I just love what you're saying, but like, how, how let's, can you just tell me a little bit about the beginning of this transition and like chasing success and no longer feeling like success did it? Well, yeah, like I, I, um, I think like a lot of people. 
somewhere along the line, I got the subliminal or subconscious message that achievement equals love. Yes. That if you're performing, if you're busy, if you are making a lot of money, if you're winning awards, if you're doing things that people talk about, that Mm -hmm. that means you're worthy of somebody's love and attention. Yes. And so having that be a really big motivator, like, you know, you say ambition, I would say if I went a level deeper, it would be love and self-worth. Yes. That was a value that I was trying to create in myself. Of course, I wanted to make an impact. Of course, I, you know, wanted to to creatively express myself and connect with other people. But my work allowed me to do that. But there was still something that I was pushing up against. Because what started to happen for me is that once I got to a level of success where I had paid off our debt and I was actively saving money and I could afford to do kind of whatever I wanted to do. I'm like, I'm not talking Lamborghinis and that Mm -hmm. kind of crap, but like just had a really great lifestyle Mm -hmm. and was proud of myself. I wasn't happy. Yeah. And like you, I felt like an asshole. You didn't use that word, but I'll use that word with myself. I'm like, what kind of an asshole are you? You're sitting here making an impact on millions of people's lives. You are able to stand on stages and share a message that changes people's lives. You are being flown first class all over the place. You can afford to eat anywhere you want. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. And what was wrong with me is one of my core values, if I put it into the language of your work, was severely violated. Yeah. I was profoundly disconnected from my husband profoundly disconnected from my kids and even my more extended family because I never saw anybody because I was working. I had exactly two friends that I saw. And so I was profoundly lonely. And I was never not working. And so I just was like, something's got to give. And what actually gave is March 8th of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. When my talk show got canceled and all of a sudden the world turned upside down and I found myself like the entire planet found themselves Mm -hmm. questioning absolutely everything. And what the greatest gift of that massive global transition was for me is it made me really assess what my values truly were. And when my husband and our three kids were then under one roof together, it made me realize how much that's all I wanted to do was be with them. And when I started to do my work, not on stages and not by getting on planes, I'm like, you know what, Mel, it's time to stop talking about and thinking about doing a podcast. It's time to get serious about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have integrity, so you got to wrap up a lot of obligations to be able to do this the right way Mm -hmm. and yes operating with excellence is part of your value Mm -hmm. so it's going to take some time to launch the way that you're going to want to launch but that was the moment for me it was values driven and I asked you the question about how you figure out your values because it's a surprisingly hard thing to do it it is so hard it is so hard and and you actually unpacked so much because, you know, I think the world has gone through a value shift in this pandemic. How so? Because the things, the values that worked before the pandemic no longer fit for most people, right? People now, we hear people talking about they want more flexibility in their job. They want to work from home. Why? Because they realized the family mattered and it was being compromised by the way they worked and did their family time. Mm. Right, But most people now haven't had the privilege of what you have of being able to pause and reflect. Right. A lot of people are still in the treadmill of life. That's what I see in my office. People call me and they're still trying to fit their old values to this post pandemic life. It needs a realignment. And how do you find your values is your question. So I talked about pain. The other way to find values, which I think is what happened to you, is this lean into the moments that you feel your best. Okay. Mm. What about the moments? What's so important? Right. You talked about being with your family. The way you said, you know, my three kids and my husband, you lighten up 
I could just see you in your living room with them during the pandemic. And I could, if I went behind your brain, I could see just Mel being content, connected, and present. Yes. Right? Versus Mel on the stage was impacting a bunch of people. But then you're in that plane and you're craving that connection, that real connection with family. And so in those moments of like flow, in those moments of quietness, ask yourself, what matters in this moment? Why is this moment important to me? Why do I feel good? And that's our values are right there. Like I know this. I do dinner with my family every day, okay? And connection and family are two of the values for me are super important. So much so that, you know, I came to see you and I'm flying to Miami this week and I'll be gone for my son for five days. My husband looked at me and said, you know what? I think we should come with you because you need that connection before you're away from him. It's not mm. going to feel good to be away from him Sat Sunday and Monday and then the, the rest of the week. Yeah. And so pulled him out of school. They came with me. And this morning he said to me, can we stay an extra day? I really like it here. <laughs> <laughs> and just that made me feel so connected with him, right? And so those moments allow us to be connected. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.